Hello, U.S. history students. So uh, we've got now the second half of our lesson about uh, President Andrew Jackson. And so part one was an introduction to Andrew Jackson, his general attitude, temperaments, uh, what politically shaped him and his style of democracy, plus uh, his response to this sort of early shaken apart moment uh, when South Carolina threatened to secede with this whole nullification crisis. Um, and in the second half of, of this lesson, I want to complicate the story with Andrew Jackson a little bit and talk about something that another move he made as president that was popular at the time, but I think as time has passed and as Americans of later generations have looked at this, it is just really not a good look. Uh, and it has to do with his, uh, his Indian policies. And so this is the area that I want to explore here in the second half of this lesson. I want to, get, I want to help us develop a full, complex understanding of this very significant president in our history. So let's jump in, Andrew Jackson, part two. You recall, students, that your uh, study guide comes with this graphic organizer. Now, the bank war uh, cell in this graphic organizer uh, is not going to apply to us because of the, the circumstances around the volleyball game that, uh, that shortened a day of school for us. But the other portions of this, if you can, if you can sort of have something to say in each of these areas, you're going to be in really excellent shape for the Unit 3 exam. Okay, so Andrew Jackson and his Indian policy, uh, his policy toward Native Americans is, as I note here, a major reason why he's viewed as a, you know, a complicated, maybe problematic uh, president from the 19th century, um, or just where it, where it gets sort of hard, right? Um, so it's easy and maybe appropriate to just... <laughs> criticize the man to dunk on him. I do want to frame up a couple thoughts here, again, just in the interest of always trying to keep things as complicated as we can here. Um, as I get into the story, I think it's worthwhile to just say, to understand why Jackson does what he does, just knowing a couple basic parameters for him. And, and one basic parameter, if we can just sort of say it, uh, is this. It was Jackson's belief that... Um, Native Americans are just going to have to move. They're just going to have to move out of the way for, for the United States to really develop, for it to flourish in the way that it seemed evident and obvious to him and Americans of that generation that it was going to. You know, for this thing, Manifest Destiny, that we'll learn about later in this unit, for this Manifest Destiny thing to happen, let's just say it, the Native Americans are going to have to move out of the way, all right? And as he said, what good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic? And so it was his view. He's like, we don't, I don't want to, you know, do this in a nasty way necessarily. I'm willing to, but I don't want to. I would like this to be kind of peaceable and equitable, you know, and just kind of move them along and we can do our thing. And frankly, they can do theirs. Um, now, he is someone, uh, he had done a lot of violence in his own life against Native Americans. He'd done a lot of violence against everybody, right? That wasn't a racial thing necessarily. He is a violent, uh, warlike person. Uh, and so he had fought Indian wars. He'd also fought alongside Native Americans, by the way. Uh, he had... Um, charitable things to say about Native Americans as warriors. Uh, frankly, he had more charitable things to say about Native Americans as warriors than he did about the British as warriors. Um, he, you know, uh, he had an adopted son who was Native American, and that was a hard story. Uh, his son, Lincoya, was saved from a, um, the site of a battlefield or a, a massacre at a village, an Indian village. He was found... Um, the, bait, the infant was found crying next to the next to his dead mother, and he told his uh, his aides, "I want to bring that child, uh, have it be brought back to my wife, and we can raise him as our own." Um, this is not someone who just seethed with sort of race hatred for Native Americans necessarily. That's not. There's just not a lot of evidence for that. Um, but his basic attitude of they're going to have to move one way or the other, and and also his basic MO, the way Jackson operated, which is just like, you can't tell me what to do. And, and sometimes even the law can't tell me what to do. And there's no order that I'm going to follow if I don't feel like following it. That, those basic attitudes are going to lead him 
into some really grim territory here that I think later Americans have come to really lament and regret. So that's what I want to talk about here. So when Jackson is president and preceding the time that Jackson was uh, president, there is a dispute in the Southeast United States between a number of states, and you can see in this map here, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, between a number of these states in the Southeast and, um, and what were called the five civilized tribes, right? These, uh, these, these five tribes that lived on reservation territory in that area. And this is like the Cherokee were the most, the most uh, became the most notorious. But there's like the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Seminole, forgive, forgive me, I'm, I'm missing one. But there's a number of these tribes that lived here. And these tribes, uh, decades earlier, had uh, legal treaties made with the United States of America. So not with Britain or with the colonies, but with the United States of America. And those legal treaties entitled them, they had this, you know, the written out contracts they, that said this land in, is entitled to the Native Americans. They will live on that land and, uh, you know, whites will stay off of that land. Um, the challenge, the trick is that, um, as we've learned, in this part of the country, uh, the cotton boom is taking off. And any available land that could be used for growing cotton it was, you know, whites there, Americans, desired to use that land to grow cotton. That's like growing cash. Uh, there was some, like, gold that was found there. That's not really, though, what's driving this. It was like, this is potential cotton farming land, and all these Native Americans are sitting there on it. And, you know, the, to the, the, the white imagination, it's like, they're not doing anything with it, and we want to do something important with it, like grow cotton, make money. So... So the states are trying to pester and hassle the Native Americans into giving them the land, right? And they say, we're, we'll, we'll give you money. We want to buy this land from you. And the Native Americans say, buzz off. We don't want to sell the land to you. Like, get out of here. We don't want to, we don't, like, you gave us this land. Look, you're the civilized people. You signed a contract with us that said this land is ours forever. The states, uh, the states push and push and the tribes sue them. It's sort of interesting to say the tribes sued the states to say, leave us alone. You can't push us off this land. These tribes are called the five civilized tribes because the tribes had done what the United States of America under earlier presidents like Thomas Jefferson had said, had, had encouraged them to do. And what the earlier U.S. government had said was, hey, it's going to be cooler for you, Native Americans, and for we Americans. And we're going to, we're going to get along much better if you learn to sort of live in with white ways, with white customs, right? So like family farming, why don't you do family farming instead of trying to range around and do kind of semi-nomadic living? Why don't you guys develop a written language? Why don't you become Christians? Why don't you dress like we do? And not all of them, but very many of the Native Americans on this territory, like in the five civilized tribes, had taken up these American customs. So there were like Native American lawyers ready to sort of file suit to, to say, buzz off, this is our land, leave us alone. That case made it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court ruled on behalf of the Native Americans saying, this isn't complicated. They, the United States of America has promised this land to them forever. They can stay if they want to stay. The states need to leave them alone. And in response to that, Andrew Jackson basically says, wrong decision, Supreme Court, because they need to go. As he was reputed to have said, Jackson remarked, John Marshall, who's a chief justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And Jackson just says, I don't care what the Supreme Court says, we're moving them off this land. So Andrew Jackson pushes Congress to pass a law called the Indian Removal Act, Indian Removal Act of 1830. And this act more or less says to these Native American groups, look, one last time, we would like to give you some money. We want to tell you to move. We're going to move you west of the Mississippi River. We're going to give you this land in Oklahoma, and that land will be yours forever. We promise. And... Um, you know, as we'll learn, Native Americans aren't dumb. You know, they're, they're looking at the situation and they kind of recognize, okay, well, 
these the United States of America it seems like they have this law that should protect us, but their president is not interested in following the law. The president has a different agenda here. And so a lot of the uh, tribes, most of the tribes, four of them, accept the deal. They just say, fine, give us the money, and they start making their way west to Oklahoma. The Cherokee are the holdouts, uh, and they just say, no, no, we have a legal right to this land. This land was given to us by the United States of America. According to their laws, we have a legal right to it. If you want to move us off this land, you got to force us off the land. And uh, that is what happened. Uh, in 1838, now Jackson has left office, but this whole policy was set in place by Jackson, and he was certainly cheering this on. Um, the United States Army shows up in this territory with the mission of, like, you got to round up and move out any Native Americans that are hanging around here. And they are forced out, forced on a march uh, from the southeast to... Um, to Oklahoma. This is called the Trail of Tears. One thing I'll note, students, this move is extremely popular at the time. This was done, this was not done to sort of like people saying, hmm, or I'm not sure, or just a lot of people complaining. This is done to great people. Americans are cheering on Andrew Jackson at the time, saying, good, he got this done. Um, this Trail of Tears is, uh, is Pretty nuts. The United States Army forcing um, 16,000 people uh, to march over 1,000 miles. About a quarter of them die along the way of exposure or starvation. Jackson is adamant the whole time, I didn't do anything wrong here. They needed to move. I was the one that moved them. And I offered them money, and they wouldn't take it. And so what was I supposed to do? We moved them out. Jackson wrote, the policy of the general government toward the red man is not only liberal, but generous. He is unwilling to submit to the laws of the states and mingle with their population. So to save him from this alternative, or perhaps utter annihilation, the government kindly offers him a new home. What Jackson is saying here is like, if we didn't do this, local whites in the southeast states were going to round up and kill him. I did this for their own good. I'm sorry. It might not have been totally legal, perfectly legal, but it had to get done. Um, one soldier who did this, who was, you know, who later wrote, I fought... I fought through the Civil War. I've seen many men shot, but that Cherokee removal was the cruelest work I ever knew. It's not a great look. And the fact that the U.S. president is doing this against the laws of the United States and against the orders of the Supreme Court makes it an even worse look. And so, in the end, we have this complex picture of a president. And, uh, you know, Jackson is very famous, known by many names. I want to ask you students here at the end, which of these nicknames seems most appropriate to you? The champion of the common man? Uh, old hickory, which is soldiers call him. Hickory is a kind of stick, kind of wood that doesn't bend very much. It's like stout. Old hickory. King Andrew, or sometimes King Mob. That's not a compliment. Uh, King Andrew or King Mob, or our worst, greatest president. <laughs> which of these strikes you as most appropriate? Students, as you're finishing and reflecting, I want to point you toward this optional Digital 3 scrapbook that you can be doing that'll sort of help you put your thoughts together and get some points uh, in the exams category of your grade. Thanks for paying attention to this, and I'll see you next time. Bye.